This hour, the warring nations are sitting down for truce talks for the very latest we cross live to our chief correspondent, Chris Reason, in Kiev. Chris, has anything come from this meeting? Well, early days at the moment, and it was due to start at 7am local time, was pushed to 10. I think it only started just before 12. So just on two and a half hours they've been going now. So we're yet to find out. And given the fact that it took them so long to even agree on a location for this meeting, uh, suggests that we might be waiting some time for any outcome. Look. Uh, nobody here is holding any great hopes that there will be a great breakthrough out of these talks. Uh, already Zelensky, the um, uh, Ukrainian president, has come out saying he's got two demands from the get-go. The first one is for an immediate ceasefire, the second um, for a withdrawal of all Russian troops. Well, that's not going to happen. We know that. The Russians haven't been publicly uh, uh, sort of saying what they want. They're just... Uh, sort of euphemistically saying we want an outcome that benefits both sides. So at this stage, we're not sure where these talks are going to go, but Zelenki said he had to turn up. If he didn't, he had to grab every opportunity he could at trying to work out a peace move. But interestingly, in, just in the moments before uh, the meeting began, he called on the European Union to admit the Ukraine into that trading block and uh, make Ukraine part of Europe. That's not exactly a statement or intent sentiment that's going to make Make the Russians any more relaxed. Anne. So these talks happening in Belarus, that country is renouncing its non-nuclear status. How concerning a development is this? Yeah, concerning again. Everything just going the wrong direction on every level with this story. But um, Belarus, which is uh, the number one ally of, uh, of Russia and has been the staging post, the launching pad for a lot of the invasion and military activity uh, over these last five days for Russia. Remember, and before it began, they were involved in the pretense of staging uh, military exercises. They are that closely tied together. Well, on Sunday, they decided to, well, they had a constitution which decided, uh, sorry, a referendum which decided to change its constitution, 65% voting to throw out its non-nuclear status. And that means that we could see nuclear weapons back into Belarus uh, for the first time since the breakup of the Soviet bloc back in 1991. We always want to see with nuclear weapons the, the retreat of them, not mm. the increase of them. So this is not good news. No, and speaking of Vladimir Putin, upping Moscow's nuclear alert, what is being made of that? Um, alarm, <laughs> concern, uh, terrifying really to be point blank. No one's expecting to go and push a red button and launch nuclear missiles on this country. But the fact that he's taken his nuclear deterrent force and put them at combat ready status all sorts of implications from that. The first of all, where does it leave the, uh, the world sort of nuclear uh, balance right now? Will America do likewise and have to raise its nuclear status? Is there potential for uh, some sort of mistake to be made uh, somewhere within the, the known powers that have nuclear weapons? You know, there's that sort of very delicate balance of the international community and, and nuclear warheads around the world. It's not a great development. Look, in terms of where Putin is on this, analysts, observers are saying it shows perhaps that he is in panic mode, desperate right now. He knows that the operations here are not working as well or as smoothly as he had planned them to go. Uh, and the fact that he's pulled out the nuclear card on day four yesterday, today day five, but he pulls that out on day four so early in this campaign surely shows a man who's been backed into a corner and we don't, you know, we don't know which way Putin will go out of this, but it's not a great move when he moves in that direction. So there is a lot of concern about where he's uh, positioned his country right now. Yeah, just so unpredictable. Rizzo, you've been doing some incredible reporting from the ground over there, showing us uh, firsthand the, the damage that's been done by the missiles. What's it like on the ground there? What's the mood and feeling? Um, today, a little bit more buoyant here in Kiev because they've had been under a, uh, a curfew for the last two days. No one's been allowed to leave their homes. Uh, a lot of people have spent most of that time in their bunkers underneath hotels and uh, in underground system. Um, so today they released that. People are allowed to come up and the first place they've gone is to pharmacies and shops. The queues everywhere we've been to this morning are incredibly long, frustratingly long. 
for everything, for petrol, for pharmacy, for basic grocery supplies, um, people stocking up again on what limited their supplies there are and getting back into their homes. They know this isn't over. It's a long way from over and it's going to be a campaign that rolls on for some time. Um, the Russians have this city uh, circled right now and circled right now and we know that that push is just going to continue. The noose is around its neck. It's going to start tightening. Um, so, look, a lot of nervous people here. But having said that, the, um, the resistance from the Ukrainians has just been remarkable. And so far, they've been able to keep them back, push them back and, and uh, create this stalemate situation. How long that will last for, though, we do not know. Mm, indeed. OK. Thank you so much. Chris Ray's in for us. Reporter Jeff Parry joins us now from Lviv. Jeff, it would appear Russia is encountering far more resistance than they would have anticipated. Are Putin's troops making any ground in their fight for major cities outside of Kiev? Yeah, well, it would seem that uh, Vladimir Putin has dis been disappointed with the progress so far. It's been said that he expected to roll up Kiev within, uh, Kiev within uh, uh, 48 hours, but, of course, that hasn't happened. Fighting's now into its uh, fifth day. Uh, there's a city east of uh, there called Kharkiv. Uh, that, yesterday, was the focus of the most of the military attention. Some, some very, very savage street fighting, uh, tanks moving into the city uh, and uh, trying to take control of it. The Ukraine the Ukrainians uh, still have that control. Uh, south of, um, of uh, Kiev, uh, there is a, a four-kilometre column of tanks and troops that are on the move. Uh, obviously, this seems to be a preparation to try and crack the city, but certainly the, um, the, the, the resistance in there was certainly, you would think, not expected by Vladimir Putin. So we're a few days into this war. Has the sentiment on the ground where you are in Lviv changed? Yes, it has. Um, they're much more responsive now to air raid sirens. Of course, w when you're seeing what's happening to your countrymen um, to the east of here, it makes you a lot more uh, aware of, of the situation and what could befall you. So, And people are moving from here. They're leaving here. Um, they, they, they believe that eventually, once Mr Putin is done with, uh, with cities like Kiev and Kharkiv and, all, and, and some of the others in between here, he will make this his target. They don't want any part of that, so they've been uh, heading for the border as well but there are people who are prepared and willing to stay and fight um, there are people here making Molotov cocktails as they are up in Kiev trying to be as prepared as they can uh, if the Russians come and just incredible okay thanks so much Jeff